How to increase customer retention in infrastructure, SaaS, or fintech. If you lead a company that needs recurring revenue and customer success to grow, such as a subscription-based infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or financial technology company, retention matters a lot, to say the least. Uh, before we get into that though, can I ask you to please take a moment and subscribe to this channel by ringing the bell so you can get notified when new content just like this becomes available. Now with that in mind, let's look at one of the most overlooked strategies that's highly effective at increasing customer retention. It all starts with understanding that customers now expect round the clock support. And the only practical way for startups and small businesses to achieve this is by first eliminating friction from sales and support, second, investing in automation, third, creating amazingly helpful self-service educational resources such as how-to videos, troubleshooting wizards and knowledge base articles, four, building communities for peer-to-peer -peer support with some limited professional moderation from your company, and fifth, hosting webinars and other live virtual events to help customers better utilize your product or service. Which of these strategies have you found to be the most effective at reducing churn and increasing customer retention in your infrastructure, software, fintech, startup, or scale up? Let me know in the comments section down there below. And if you need some help figuring out what your strategy should be for increasing retention and reducing churn over at your infrastructure, software, or fintech startup, I may be able to help. Feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick note note about the kind of help that you're looking for and we may be able to work together. I am Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run and I wish you great success at becoming more effective in reducing churn and increasing customer retention and your infrastructure SaaS or fintech startup. How to build customer loyalty in infrastructure, software, and fintech. If your company depends on recurring subscription revenue, you're likely to prioritize customer success as one of your most important ways to build a more loyal customer base. So let's look at how your company can build customer loyalty for your infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or financial technology company. What can you do with social media to generate more loyalty and trust from your prospects and customers. Like so many things in life and in business, it depends. For infrastructure SaaS and FinTech companies, social media can create tremendous loyalty and trust from your prospects and customers. However, it's a big however, to approach this correctly, social needs to become an overall part of your company's branding investment and how it wants to be perceived in the marketplace. Generating loyalty and trust is usually solved by positioning your company and your team as subject matter experts, trusted advisors, and thought leaders. For B2B tech companies, LinkedIn and YouTube are great social channels for achieving these goals. For example, the Edelman LinkedIn B2B Thought Leadership Impact Study found that 89% of B2B buyers see thought leadership as enhancing the perceptions of an organization. And this is thought leadership that's promoted on social media, among other channels. And just under half, 49% of those surveyed, said that this thought leadership influences purchase decision. So 89% see thought leadership as enhancing their perception of a company. And just about half, 49% say that that thought leadership actually influences their purchase decisions. That said, untrained salespeople really can erode trust quite quickly on LinkedIn by one or more of the following toxic activities, or what I call the six LinkedIn mistakes that make you look bad. First up, don't spam LinkedIn posts with self-serving comments and sales pitches. Second, don't spam LinkedIn inbox with messages and in-mails with sales pitches that are begging for 15-minute meetings. Third, do not make an aggressive sales pitch in your connection request message. Fourth, don't pitch me on meeting virtually with you immediately after I accept your LinkedIn connection request. Fifth, do not repeatedly view my LinkedIn profile or constantly like my posts in a desperate attempt to get my attention. And number six, don't post about how wonderful you are and how great your products and services are. I'm sure your boss cares about it. Some of your coworkers might, maybe mom does, but the reality is most of the prospects that you're looking to build relationships with have not yet heard of your company. And in order to get them to pay attention to you, they have to see you first as having valuable information, valuable content, 
worth interacting with. And that starts by understanding their goals, their challenges, their problems, and offering content that can help with that. So what have you found helpful for building greater customer loyalty among your infrastructure, software, fintech customer base? Let me know down there in the comments below. And if you're looking to get some help with building a more loyal customer base, among your infrastructure, software, fintech customers, I may be able to help. Feel free to send me a quick note on LinkedIn about what kind of help you're looking for and we may be able to work together. I am Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run and I wish you great success in building greater loyalty among your subscribers. So it's kind of like looking at the dashboard of your car and figuring out if you're driving at what speed and how many miles. What is customer churn and how can you reduce customer churn? Every kind of business has a different way of calculating and reducing their overall churn. For a SaaS, for a software as a service business, Make sure that your product roadmap and resulting research and development, marketing, sales, and customer success investments all focus on solving your customer's biggest challenges and helping them get to their biggest goals. The jobs theory, commonly referred to as jobs to be done, was developed by the late Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School and is an excellent framework for understanding the job that your SaaS product is hired to do. As a result, the competitive alternatives are summarily fired. Instrument your SaaS platform to measure leading indicators of customer churn. Once you know the actual job that your customers hire your software product to do, you can build in metrics and instrumentation within the platform so you can measure various degrees of utilization and goal attainment. So it's kind of like looking at the dashboard of your car and figuring out if you're driving at what speed and how many miles. Uh, this is an important part of figuring out how your customers are actually using your platform. SaaS companies scaling around product-led growth or PLG, such as Slack, Zoom, Dropbox, and HubSpot, all have ways to know how customers utilize their software and when a customer crosses a certain product utilization threshold that for all intents and purposes guarantees that the customer is getting enough value to stick and nearly for all intents and purposes eliminates the risk of customer churn. This is super important in any kind of recurring revenue or subscription based business like software as a service. Once a SaaS company has adopted a focus around solving customer problems, and they've prioritized the underlying true job to be done around that, and they've developed code within their platform, the gauges to be able to measure product utilization and progress towards goal attainment, you can then define what initial value, intended value, and extended value actually looks like from a customer success standpoint. You should also look to build a company culture around that solves for customer success and reduces customer churn. Silos, you know, that, that's not going to help you in this particular aspect. It's really important to get the entire, all your teams, all your company rallied around the goal of prioritizing the customer's goals. Product teams, customer success teams, and customer marketing teams really need to be focusing resources on driving good fit customers towards goal attainment that in the process minimizes churn. This also becomes super helpful in a growth flywheel scenario where you're looking for your customers to become delighted customers and then brand evangelists and promoters that help spread positive word of mouth with positive social proof, positive reviews that keep your flywheel spinning and accelerate your rate of growth. Conversely, if you mess this up and you have a high churn rate, you have the opposite scenario, so you don't, you don't want to do that. Um, in inbound marketing, again, this intended state happens in the delight phase of the inbound methodology, the mindset around customer delight, is the idea that your growth flywheel is spinning in a world where so much of the buyer's journey depends on these uh, reviews and social proof. The marketing and sales teams then can focus on making sure that they're attracting and engaging with the attract and the engage phase of the uh, inbound methodology with good fit customers that have the highest likelihood of being delighted because we've done the pattern matching and we've figured out not only how to get to product market fit, but how to get to 
uh, go-to-market fits. The focus here also helps inform strategy around your buyer personas, your buyer's journey mapping, your ideal client profiles, and overall basically how to fill the top, middle, and bottom of your demand generation funnel. Uh, what has your company done to be able to measure, get a better handle on customer churn, minimize customer churn, and maximize customer success? Let me know in the comments section down below. Also, make sure that you take a moment to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell so you can be notified when new content just like this becomes available. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and if you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one assistance with helping to build a program that minimizes your customer churn throughout your entire journey and flywheel, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick note about what kinds of help you're looking for, and I may be able to help your company address these issues. Um, thanks so much for stopping by today and watching this video, and I look forward to hearing your great success stories and how you've successfully conquered customer churn. That content can also be used to inspire new customers to follow in their footsteps of your most successful customers. Three ways to reduce churn with email marketing. Wikipedia defines the churn rate when applied to your customer base as the proportion of contractual customers or subscribers who leave a supplier during a given time period. If your business depends on recurring revenue streams and improving customer success is a priority, you've likely confronted the opposite of the happy state where monthly recurring revenue or MRR and customer success are super healthy. To help your company reduce churn, let's look at three ways that you can use email marketing to improve the customer experience dramatically. But before we do that, can I ask you to please take a moment and subscribe to this YouTube channel and ring the bell so you can be notified when new content just like this becomes available. So first up, I want you to deploy email marketing best practices for improving customer retention. For each buyer persona that goes to closed one, in other words, the lifecycle stage advances to customer, the most important email that you can send shows how to get the initial value as quickly as possible from their newly purchased product or service, your product or service that they just purchased. The email messages call to action, the CTA should go to a website page or a knowledge base post with an embedded video that shows how to get the quick wins that drive customer retention and reduce churn. You'll be able to measure on a user by user basis your opens, clicks, session time on the website page, as well as view time on the video. And if your marketing automation supports event-based workflows, consider a follow-up email one or two days later to anyone who has not spent significant time on that website page or consumed that particular video or who hasn't otherwise shown evidence of using your product or service. Next, look to add interactivity to your customer retention emails. When you're trying to positively influence your product and service usage and customer retention while you're simultaneously reducing your churn rate, lean heavily on interactive elements that educate and build trust. For today's modern content playbook, that's almost always going to be using more video content. So your email message should have a thumbnail of the video with a big clickable play button. Also be sure to include multiple calls to action, multiple CTAs, both buttons and text links driving to the same website page with embedded video. This way you can measure which CTAs are driving the most engagement and customer success, and then subsequently optimize and prioritize those email marketing messages that are working best, that have the most impactful CTA messaging getting prioritized. Then make sure that you invest in customer insight research early and often. The more you talk with your customers and build and maintain buyer personas, the more likely you'll uncover pattern recognition that you need to see for more effective welcome emails. However, this customer insight, especially in a startup that is seeking product market fit or go to market fit, needs to be shared across your marketing, sales, customer success, and product team. When you're able to flip great net promoter score, NPS advocates into case study content. When you're able to transform your most satisfied clients, your customers into case studies, that content can also be used to inspire new customers to follow in their footsteps of your most successful customers that are most similar to them, essentially the same buyer persona. 
These social proof assets can also be very helpful in proactively reducing customer churn. What kinds of email marketing campaigns and content assets have you found most effective for reducing churn? Let me know in the comments section down there below. And if you're looking for help at driving greater success and reducing customer churn in your business, I may be able to help. Feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick message about what kinds of help you're looking for, and we may be able to work together. I am Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I wish you great success in being able to drive more customer success, be able to improve your customer retention, reduce your churn, and be able to do most of the heavy lifting with email marketing automation. Free round trip shipping policy got people confident buying shoes online because, you know, let's face it, two decades ago, buying shoes online was a pretty crazy idea, right? Um, Companies like Instacart have made it super easy. What does SaaS customer success look like in a world that's become totally, completely Amazonified? Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. And in this video, I want to talk with you about my thoughts, my insights on how Amazon Netflix, Google, Apple have really all changed the way that customer perceptions work. Because a lot of these habits that we start picking up at home on the business to consumer side very much impact how we navigate the business to business buyer's journey. And ever since the mainstream adoption of mobile devices and social media more than 10 years ago, the way people research and make purchase decisions has been changing quite dramatically. On the B2B side, it's now very common to find that buyers will flat out refuse to speak to someone in a sales capacity until they're at least 60% or 70% of the way done with their research and purchase decision. Now, Many business leaders don't realize how many times their company is eliminated from the consideration set because their digital approach is just still stuck in the past. And this is a shame, but a lot of people are deciding who's on the short list and who's not by what they find out about your company on your own website, on social media, by doing research, and essentially the modern digital equivalent of word of mouth. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically accelerated this digital transformation in ways that very few could have envisioned, at least not at the speed. Um, companies like Amazon, Google, and Netflix have flourished in this environment, as have companies like Zoom, right? Um, but other companies without these massive resources or moats or visions have really struggled. The pandemic is profoundly changing people's purchase habits. You know, I think about my own personal purchase habits. Heck, I consider myself pretty digitally savvy. I do digital marketing as my career, right? Um, and, but you know, my family had never ordered groceries, perishable groceries at least, until March of 2020. Now, you know, for at least 12 months since then, we haven't set foot in a grocery store or a warehouse club. And I'm sure that'll change as restrictions start to lift and life returns a little more back to normal, but in much the same way that Zappos's revolutionary free round trip shipping policy got people confident buying shoes online because, you know, let's face it, two decades ago, buying shoes online was a pretty crazy idea, right? Um, Companies like Instacart have made it super easy f to get made whole, to make merchants have retailers make good on regrettable purchases, on crappy purchases. Um, so you know, I think about for my own family, we live 20 minutes away from the warehouse club and pre-pandemic, you know, we'd go there probably a couple times a month. And if we bought produce, like maybe $7 worth of English cucumbers that ended up being spoiled, you know, tasted lousy, tasted flavorless, you know, well past the date at which they should have been sold, we'd more than likely just toss the yucky cucumbers out in the garbage and figuratively and um, literally eat, well, not 
literally eat, but you know, being forced to, to write off essentially the $7 plus tax. And it certainly wouldn't be worth our time or spending another 40 minutes of round trip travel time and gas and waiting in line um, for the customer service return line. However, if now we get our grocery order delivered and find that the cucumbers taste lousy, my wife just clicks a button in the app to report the problem and answers a question or two, and the amount of the purchase is refunded back to the credit card. And I'd like to idealistically think that if the produce purchasing agent for this big national, I think international warehouse club, um, gets enough cucumber refunds, enough people reporting that their cucumbers taste lousy, that somewhere along the line, the purchase agent is going to reach out to the produce grower and find out what the heck is going on with the cucumbers. Um, but again, this is just one example of how people's expectations with purchases online and digitally are really changing expectations. So of course, this kind of digital customer experience is a game changer from expectations uh, from now on. So when you think about setting your company up for success, think about what your SaaS customer success needs to look like in a world that has become Amazonified. Think about what you can do to help people self-serve, create amazingly helpful self-service resources like how-to videos, troubleshooting wizards, and knowledge articles, even a chatbot. Anything that you can do to allow somebody at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon to get answers to their problem without having to wait till Monday morning. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. And I want to explain briefly my five customer marketing strategies for B2B SaaS. Now, a lot of this should be taken in the context that people's expectations have changed a lot. We've gone through like a decade's worth of digital transformation during the past few months, and so many people now are consuming products and services digitally that didn't in the past. I mean, a perfect example is my family, even though pretty digitally savvy, had never ordered perishable groceries online until you know, about a year ago, but yet here we find ourselves a year later and everything's being delivered digitally. That's our new grocery store. And it's not just a single grocery store, it's a couple of different apps and it saves a ton of time and we get the best of exactly what we want. And all of these purchase preferences, whether it's streaming video, streaming audio, how you go about researching and purchasing cars, houses, clothes, food, all it's changed so much. And people bring these same purchase preferences with them into the workplace. So what can you do from the perspective of B2B SaaS to make sure that your company is set up for success with customer marketing? Uh, first and foremost is to talk about what you can do to eliminate friction from sales and support. How do you figure out where friction is? Well, start by documenting the steps that a external party, a prospect or customer would have to go through to interact with your sales team or interact with your support team. And if you're concerned that you may not be as objective about it, hire somebody else who's external to you and watch over their shoulder as they do this on a, on a Zoom call or go to a meeting or something like that. So you can figure out exactly where the sources of friction are and then take steps to eliminate those sources of friction to make your company easier to deal with. So you don't make them jump through so many hoops. Because if you don't do that, at some point your competition will make it easier to deal with then they're gonna win. There's a lot of use cases over the past five years or so of companies winning by providing a great customer experience, even being able to command a premium price for that. Second customer marketing tip for B2B SaaS is to invest in automation. People just want immediate gratification. Think about trying to satisfy the expectations of a baby boomer compared to somebody that's middle-aged, compared to a millennial, compared to you know, a 10-year-old. And when I look at just my own kids where there's a five-year age difference where one grew up just before the iPad came out and the other one has never known life without an iPad, the levels of immediate expectations are very, very different. But the thing is, like, this is now 
infiltrated all generations. So even when you're selling to people that are nearing the end of the late stages of their career, um, they still have this expectation of immediacy. So anything you can do to put simple automation in place, whether it's self book calendar, whether it's email workflow automation, sales workflow automation, obviously you want to make sure that it's improving the user experience and not frustrating people, but that will make a world of difference for improving your customer marketing. Uh, third is think about what you can do to help people self-serve, create amazingly helpful self-service resources like how-to videos, troubleshooting wizards, and knowledge articles, even a chatbot. Anything you can do to allow somebody at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon to get answers to their problem without having to wait till Monday morning or someone at 2 o'clock on a Monday afternoon being able to get self-service answers to their problem without having to wait a couple of hours for a callback or sit on hold or something like that is generally a win-win. There's a ton of research on people preferring to self-serve and troubleshoot their own problems to the extent that it saves a, a lot of time and effort on their part compared to dealing with us annoying humans, right? <laughs> so step number four for customer marketing success with uh, B2B SaaS is to look to build communities of like-minded peers among your happy customers to provide peer-to-peer -peer support. When you think about selling to similar kinds of buyer personas that all have similar kind of goals, plans, challenges, where they hang out online and offline, what they're worried about, what they get, what they get excited about, they generally like to talk to each other. And to the extent that you've done well with delighting your customers into promoters, think about setting up a basic community where they can interact and help each other, whether it's a LinkedIn group, a Facebook group, a Slack channel, something like that. And of course, you probably want to have somebody from your team helping to moderate it and keep it on track and jump in when things get a little bit off the rails, but people generally really enjoy participating in those kind of peer communities. And five is to think about what you can do to host webinars and other online events to pe help people better utilize your products or services. And this can be as simple and low tech as like an ask me anything kind of webinar with your head of engineering or your head of product or your CEO or something like that. Uh, for customers, for products, all of this, again, help people achieve greater success. So if you're looking for five simple steps for customer marketing for B2B SaaS, look no further than eliminating friction, investing in automation, create self-service resources, build a community, and host great online events. With most modern CRM systems, there's usually dozens, if not more, native integrations, and then there's uh, iPaaS systems like PySync and similar kinds of two-way synchronization systems like Zapier. There's a lot of ways to make sure that your systems talk together. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I want to speak with you today for a few moments about how you can align sales, marketing, and customer success. First up, make sure that you find an executive sponsor that's a minimum of one level above marketing, sales, and customer success in your organization. For a startup or a scale-up that has probably less than 100 employees and not much more than that, you'll likely need the support of your CEO, COO, or CRO, uh, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, or Chief Revenue Officer. This person will be the judicial branch that resolves disputes or makes sure that silos don't pop up that prevent your teams from doing what they need to do, especially for what's best for the customer. Uh, HubSpot has talked about this for years. They call it SFTC, solve for the customer. Uh, making sure that your customers' needs always come first above the individual needs of people within your organization. Second up, when it comes to aligning your sales, marketing, and customer success, is make sure that you build a service level agreement, an SLA, with a representative from each team. Think of this document like wedding vows, where you define which team carries which responsibilities, who's basically responsible for what. Third, make sure that you organize all of your communications into a single CRM system. Every customer facing team member really needs access to the same information in real time. If you need to cobble together multiple tools, it's super critical that these tools be integrated together. And with most modern CRM systems, there's usually dozens if not more native integrations and then there's uh, iPaaS systems like PySync and similar kinds of two-way synchronization systems like Zapier. There's a lot of ways to make sure that your systems talk together, but it's super critical to make sure that everyone across those three teams in your organization has access to the same information in very close to real time. Um, fourth, make sure that you 
encourage warm handoffs. For example, you could have your account executive that closed the deal, closed the sale, attend at least the initial onboarding call. That's super critical to make sure that your valued clients, your valued customers never have to repeat themselves. And fifth, but last but not least, make sure that you relentlessly eliminate friction from your internal and customer facing processes. Anytime you encounter an opportunity to empower your team members, or your clients to accelerate their journey or time to value. Time to value is super critical in a SaaS company. Uh, there is an opportunity to improve how you go about and deliver your product or service. So in this short video, you've learned a few tips on how you can align sales, marketing and customer success. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Love to hear from you, and if you are looking for any one-on-one -on -one assistance, feel free to reach out. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Four customer insight strategies for infrastructure, software, and fintech companies. In this short video, I want to introduce you to four of my favorite ways to get deeper customer insight on what's going on within your prospects and customers. First and foremost, think about using simple Q&A blog post interviews with your prospects and customers to find out about how they got into where they are right now, how they fit in with their teams, how their teams fit in with the rest of the company, what are the big priority initiatives they're working on, what advice they'd offer to someone that's just getting started, what advice they'd offer to someone who's been in the business for quite some time, as well as what they see the future of their job role and their industry looking like. In addition to running these as simple Q&A blog interviews, you could do a video podcast where you interview prospects and customers on webcam and get them to share their thoughts around this. From the video podcast, you could extract an audio podcast. So in addition to having great video content to share on YouTube and similar kind of video sites, you'll also have audio content that you can share on Apple Podcasts and similar kind of more traditional audio podcast sites. Above and beyond this normal tactic of running your interviews on, on video or audio conference or blog posts, when you're able to, you and when it makes sense, you can also travel out to client sites and do professional videography where you interview them in person for highly produced case study kinds of interviews. But the beauty of all of these interviews starting on video is from video you can go to audio and from audio or video you can easily transcribe it and turn it into print content. It's typically way more difficult to go from print to video, uh, which is why it's so much easier to capture in the video format first. Um, in addition, you could double dip and at the same time you're getting customer insight, be creating valuable content marketing assets in this context. By creating a series of podcast interviews around this, you can also use paid amplification around this. For example, if you're doing account-based marketing, it may make sense to take these interviews and use, for example, LinkedIn ads to get that out to other stakeholders in the same company or similar kinds of companies. But again, the, the primary source on this is usually going to be prospects that are an especially good fit for your ideal client profile. So hopefully this has given you some good food for thought on some customer insight strategies that you can use to grow your go-to-market GDM strategy for your infrastructure as a service, software as a service, or fintech company. I'm Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run, and I would love to hear about what you're doing in your own company to get better customer insight. Let me know in the comments below. And if you need some one-on-one -on -one assistance, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn, send me a quick message, connect with me, and we can interact over there as well. So I wish you great success in being able to use customer insight as a strategic competitive weapon to grow Joshua, you know, there's the old adage that um, everyone works in sales, but I think that everyone works in education, at least in B2B SaaS. We are all educators, no matter what your job role is. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run.
Hi, it's Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized podcast, and I have a very special guest in front with me today, Angela Hicks. Angela is Director of Education and Training at TapClix. Angela, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Joshua, thanks for having me. It's so great to be here. Likewise. So the first place that I usually like to start with most guests is for you to give us a little bit of context on how you ended up in your current role. What was your current journey? Did you know that you always wanted to get into some facet of customer education and and using education to grow a, a technology company? Sure. That's a great question. The answer is absolutely not. I did not know that was where I would end up. Um, I actually have a BFA in graphic design and an MA in advertising and PR. I've always loved technology and using computers and software. So that's always been something that I've enjoyed even as a very young child. But um, after I finished graduate school, I did have a teaching fellowship and I kind of got the itch to um, teach people great things. So I've spent most of my career working in SaaS. Um, I've worked at Apple, HubSpot, and now I'm at TapClicks. That's terrific. And you're really, at, it's a great time inflection point to be thinking about the role of companies in deploying education because so much of what we've gone through in the last 12 months or so has challenged K-12 to and challenged higher education to rethink of creative ways. But you know, now we have seen over the last five, five, six, seven years, and, and SaaS especially, that there's a really strong playbook around using education to attract the right people and get the right messaging out there and build alignment. Absolutely. Joshua, you know, there's the old adage that um, everyone works in sales, but I think that everyone works in education, at least in B2B SaaS. We are all educators, no matter what your job role is. Yeah, I mean, you keep seeing that trend that people have been talking about for the last one, two, three years about instead of building a traditional marketing team, build a media company, the role of trying to get uh, sales and customer success very actively involved in being seen as educators and thought leaders and advisors. It definitely seems a really important part of the playbook for high growth B2B tech companies. I agree. So with all of that in mind, what advice would you offer to someone that's just getting started in working for a B2B focused company, either in marketing or sales or customer success or support or onboarding or or training and education? What do you think is the most important area that someone should concentrate on that's right out of school that's getting started in this kind of role? I think for someone that's just getting started, um, really finding what kind of content you enjoy creating and you're good at. So, uh, you know, there are so many ways that you can tell a good and educational story and then the format of that content, what that looks like. Uh, I think that's just really important, much like, you know, this, this conversation that we're having now, you know, this could have very easily been a blog post or lots of other different types of content. So that's what I would recommend is um, when you're just getting started, really stretching um, out to try all different forms of content creation. So for someone that may be comfortable writing a blog post, what would you say is the next logical step for them to evolve into turning the microphone on and try audio if they're comfortable with audio, getting them to try video if they're comfortable with video, maybe video in front of more people? Is there? Do you see like a logical progression with that to be able to fill those different modalities? Or do you feel that there's certain kinds of people that are just really well suited for one kind of format and uh, they're best by just really getting uh, like mastercraft at that kind of format? Yeah, I mean, creativity is certainly a skill and a a muscle that you can gain and stretch. So um, I think for that person, if they wrote a blog post, trying to repurpose that content, there's no need to just create brand new content every single time. Um, But taking that content that you have and trying to figure out what is the short form and what is the longer form. Um, So, you know, with that blog post, can I turn it into 
an audio snippet? Am I going to share it on social? What would that message be? What would the visual be to accompany that audio? Um, and then of course, video. I think, uh, especially over the past few years, we've all gotten a little more comfortable being on video since it's um, a part of everyone's day these days at work. Video is a really interesting animal as well to be tackling and thinking about in the context of what we just went through. Because I think about to three, four or five years ago when I'd have a conversation with a small business client and they were brand new to video, their first reaction was thinking that they needed to find a couple thousand dollars for a professional video shoot to bring in a videographer for a half a day. And they'd have this overproduced video that took like two or three months to go live. And because it was so painful and so expensive and time consuming, it would sit under like museum glass for two or three years and not be touched and you go back to them and say, Hey, wait a second. You know, that information isn't current. It needs to be maintained. And by the way, there's six other verticals and five other products that we need similar videos for. I think what one of the silver linings that we've gone through is it seems like people have finally gotten a little more comfortable with the idea that they can get an A minus or a B plus in production value. Um, but the content value and being able to get the content out fast seems to matter. Finally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not just about the aesthetics. Right. There's there's always a trade-off, right? I Even if you have the budget, you have the space, you have the equipment, it's still going to take time to plan. And you're right. We've seen this shift over the past few years. People have finally been like, oh, with video, you know, I can move very quickly. So it is a great medium to use for um, getting this, you know, ever shifting message out very quickly. It's like Zoom has become the new studio and yes. the production equipment is the webcam and perhaps a better microphone, perhaps a better headset, maybe a little bit of lighting, but like an order of magnitude easier order of magnitude less expensive, less of an initial investment than people would have done in the past. And um, for years, everyone's been throwing around the statistics that by like in the next year or two, that 80% of the traffic on the web was on the internet was going to be video. And it seems like we're headed in that direction awfully right. quickly. Yeah. I, I think if you look to YouTube or Twitch's numbers, that's, yeah. that's definitely where we are. <laughs> yeah. And it's like TikTok, there's just so many, it's, it, there was longer videos. Now there's videos for people that are attention starved. They can only pay attention for 10 or 15 seconds, but videos become a really, really big medium. So that's really great advice for the beginner to start with just one particular content format and eventually grow from there. It could be someone that's working in a support or a sales role that realizes that every time they document a ticket or have a conversation, they're potentially coming up with the content idea. Uh, it could be someone that's a blogger that grows into podcasting, a podcaster that grows into videos or webinars or offline webinars, in-person uh, events. What if, what strategy, what advice, what insight could you offer to someone that has been in a B2B technology role in marketing or sales or customer success or onboarding, and maybe they're 10, 15, 20 years into their career and the last year has been really difficult. Maybe their company had a lot of turnover. Maybe their team had a lot of turnover. Maybe they're in an industry that's particularly hard. What advice would you offer them to use to help reset and get back on track? So Joshua, at TapClicks, I spend a lot of time um, working with customers that are using our platform to bring all of their data together and really get a unified look at all of their campaigns, everything that's going on across all of their platforms. So that advanced marketer that you're talking about, uh, what comes to mind for me is uh, kind of some confirmation bias that can occur when you have all of that data. So by confirmation, bias, I mean, you are looking for the data that supports what you think should be your next step. So I, I think um, when you can find what you're looking for, support your, your claim and build a good argument with data, that can be kind of dangerous. So my recommendation is to really expand your horizons. Um, quantitative data is fantastic. But don't forget about qualitative data. Uh, if you've been working with your company for 10 plus years, uh, you probably know your personas um, have written, you know, many an article about them. You have just quite the bio on them. But, um, you know, really 
take some time to do some more research and interviews to make sure that your persona hasn't changed. If you're biz- if you've been in the business for a decade, your products and services have changed. That's that's just the reality. So that means that your personas continue to change. Their needs change. Um, so that would be my advice for the advanced marketer. Do you think there's a danger in that sometimes the easiest things to measure with attribution are the ones that are put up on a pedestal and some of the more difficult things to quantify are often ignored because you're trying to make the numbers to have it you know, look like you're being successful up the chain and board reporting and everything else that comes with KPIs and OKRs. and. Right. I mean, Joshua, we were just talking about video and, you know, I could certainly surface some numbers like look at all of these views that we're having. We need to really double down on our efforts with video instead of, you know, going in this direction and putting more content on this channel. Um, you know, that could be easy for me to find if I've been working with marketing analytics for a while. It's kind of like the classic case of chasing the vanity metric as opposed to being grounded in something we've talked about for years, the smart goals, the ones that are relevant to uh, the overall mission of the business and being right. grounded on what you're trying to accomplish. And with it's, if it's onboarding, it's probably product utilization and retention. If it's customer success, maybe it's expansion. With marketing has their top and middle of the funnel. Sales has their bottom of the funnel. But yeah, it's, it, I could totally see how someone looking for easy answers finds what's in front of them and tries to craft a story around that as opposed to taking a step back and doing like the five whys, right? Yeah, yeah. That's really important, especially, you know, when you've been um, in your role for so long. Get out of the, the kind of tunnel vision of it. Yeah. Hanging yeah. around with the same people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see the role of B2B changing as someone is planning a strategy to go through a full life cycle from awareness to consideration to decision to post-purchase? What are you thinking about with education, training, and content to take the context of like a life cycle into account? Yeah, so we've had very um, sophisticated buyers for a long time. They want to learn a lot but way before they get involved with sales, right? We have that luxury for finding prospects that really want to know what our products and services are. So um, you really need to provide as much content uh, that that person, that individual needs, as well as all of the others that are involved in that purchasing process. So I know um, a couple of years ago, they talked about for a B2B, it's almost eight people that are involved in every single purchase. So that's a lot of stakeholders that you have to get on board. Um, in fact, Joshua, I was talking with a friend of mine who is, is not in B2B, but she was telling me about some new software that they were going to be using at her company. It's rather technical. And um, she was telling me that, oh, you know, I'll learn this. But she, I asked her, I was like, well, why are you changing software? And she didn't really tell me what the benefit was to her, the end user, the person that was going to be using that software. She didn't learn that in her training. And I, of course, was really disappointed that she was going to have to learn software and didn't understand how it was going to help her in her job um, work more efficiently. But um, I just wanted to share that story that sometimes we forget about all of those stakeholders. Um, there is a switching cost. You know, whenever we take on new software, we really need to take into account every person that's going to be using that software. Yeah, you bring up a couple of really great points. Like when you think about the decision by committee and more and more stakeholders being involved, it's more and more people where you have to find what the value is for them throughout the whole evaluation purchase implementation cycle. And if three or four of those eight people aren't really clear on how it helps them, uh, you don't really have an internal champion. You have potentially an internal detractor, right? 
right. if, uh, it starts to unravel. And then the content piece, when I talk to companies that are just getting started with this kind of initiative, it's usually one extreme or the other as they look at some large company that has dozens or hundreds of people that are creating blogs and podcasts and they they think that they're going to emulate that in the first six months to a year or they just see that oh okay yeah we have a white paper and we did a webinar once and it didn't work and now we're not going to do content anymore and you just think about the sheer number of eight stakeholders three four five different stages that they go through and you start to realize very quickly that it seems like companies that don't have a strong content editorial process kind of publishing engine and mindset and culture behind this are going to fall behind awfully quickly and may not recover. Right. And, you know, with content, those, those different stakeholders have different levels of interest. Unfortunately, those eight people, they're not all going to have the same level of investment in education. So, um, you know, perhaps the person that's in charge of the budget, maybe the person in finance, they just might not want to know every last detail about your software. Um, they just don't have the time and it's not going to necessarily impact their day to day, but they do need enough information to make an informed decision. Seems like that goes along with the trend also that I've seen in the last year or two where the role of the product marketing manager seems to be a lot more front and center as more and more companies in the B2B space are trying to create frictionless purchase experiences where they're hearing repeatedly that people don't want to go through two or three levels of sales qualification and to spend a half hour proving to the sales development rep that they are have permission to speak to the real sales rep to really find out what the product is and what the pricing. It seems like if anything, what we've gone through in the last year, there's going to be an acceleration towards making it easier for people to try, look at the whole product led growth movement, all seems to be supporting the same general trend that buyers are in control. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, we, we've always talked about creating content for all phases of the life cycle, uh, as well as for different personas. But I, I think it is a little more clear for me just thinking about what kinds of educational content a person might need based on what, what their role is as a stakeholder. That's great advice content grounded in content. And these are their assets over time. What a lot of people don't realize also when they're thinking and they're trying to compare these to a one-time training event or a one-time marketing event, they're thinking that they're going to have something ROI wise to measure when the when, when it initially launches, when in reality, if it's reasonably evergreen, um, it will need some maintenance over time, certainly as SaaS platforms change, uh, customer onboarding and training can become out of date very relatively quickly in a matter of weeks or months, but these definitely the whole, these programs typically are assets. Yeah. And Joshua, I would say, you know, further along education is a great way for someone to get a sense of your products and services. Um, demos are great, but again, not everyone is going to have the time, interest, or perhaps the know-how to really make good use of a demo or a, a trial experience. So um, again, education, that, that kind of content can really help you out here. For that person that maybe is not going to use the software, doesn't know how, you know, providing enough um, educational content, whether that's a, a video showing walkthroughs, um, of course, written information, instructional content, uh, describing how things work, that can really help um, with further stages in that journey to becoming a customer. Oh, yeah. I want to think about the education. It seems it's solving one of the most important things with potential buyers of uh, building trust. Yes. And depending on the kind of buyer, if you think about someone that's like an IT role or an engineering role that's higher levels of higher education, like PhD, that it seems the level of cynicism would be even higher. The mistrust of marketing and sales claims would be, it'd be even more nervous about that and using education, using trials, getting to see behind the scenes is more important than ever for overcoming people's fear. Right, right. And, 
you know, I think you would see that in your churn rate. And a way that you can get ahead of that is to make sure that you're not landing the wrong kinds of customers. And I think that most of the time, the wrong kind of customer comes from being an, you know, an ill-informed prospect. Focusing on short-term results as opposed to finding good long-term. Right. Yeah. yeah. So with that in mind, what do you see as the biggest mistake that B2B focused teams are making with their overall strategy? Is it thinking too myopically when it comes to looking for data to tell the story that you already are convinced that you're going to tell? Is it looking at vanity metrics? Is it thinking too short term? What's the single biggest error that you see people making with their B2B strategy? Yeah. So Joshua, you know, we've all been rather resilient in trying times, but uh, that has also kind of caused a, a great enlightenment period for creativity. I've seen a lot of people, you know, stretching out of their comfort zone and experimenting, trying lots of new things in marketing um, during such uncertain times. And with that, I, I think a mistake that's happening is that we're not evaluating those things. We all just kind of needed to move quickly, take some risks. Um, but now is the time to kind of step back and and reevaluate. You know, we tried TikTok over the past eight months. How is that actually doing? Um, are we getting the results that we want from that channel? Uh, that seems to be the mistake that people are making, just continue to spread out and try new things, but not coming back together and s evaluating how things fit into your strategy. You see it as like being spread too thin and not really connecting the investments to the priorities for that persona or just the overall business goals. Right. Like, let's, let's just try this. Let's see how this goes. Um, but it's good to kind of regroup and, and see if that is working towards what you're really trying to accomplish. So in closing, where do you see B2B marketing, sales, customer success, onboarding, education and training heading in the next 18, 24 months or so? Do you see something that's going on right now that's going to be a major inflection point where we're going to look back and be like, oh, yeah, that was the big thing that really changed it all with how people were getting better value, how companies were getting better value, how companies were growing, utilization was growing? I think that we've seen um, a lot more automation and we have been expanding to more channels. So I think that things are just going to get a little more complicated. As, as you know, when you take on um, a new communication method, you do need to monitor and analyze that to see how how your campaigns are doing, how effective is your storytelling. So I think we are going to, you know, try even harder to get a good glimpse into the omni-channel, like what we're doing with all of our marketing efforts. Um, and, and I think something is going to change in terms of automation. I think it's going, I hope it's going to get easier um, in the next 18 to 24 months. So as we're trying to make sense of what's working really, really well, what's marginal, what's not working at all, um, the thought is that we'll have some tools that will help us in a better automated way figure out what's actually working and helping us optimize without having to dive in and out of 10, 20, 30 different tools and try to have different ways of measuring actually all make sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with my day to day sitting in education, I have seen um, educators from all over, even in K through 12, really thinking through how we measure the effectiveness of education. So, um, you know, perhaps if you were teaching third grade five years ago, maybe you had just um, standardized tests and in the classroom experiences to to count on and rely on. But um, even even that industry is really thinking through what metrics matter. 
seen even with my own kids how much there have been some teachers that really embraced getting really good at running Google Meets and how to engage the class and what to do the right way, wrong way with webcam and audio. And some of them have just been in deer and headlights. And a lot of the signs were probably starting three, four or five years ago because a lot of the schools were providing professional development days around the technology and some of the teachers were embracing it and some of them not so much. And this has forced an acceleration of tech adoption. Some have done well, some have uh, not. And I think in a lot of cases, they're going to figure out like, what is the future of education going to look like to take all of this into account going forward? Right. I mean, as we know, playing a video or visiting a page, getting a view does not equal engagement. So I, I do think that's what we will see more of in education, even more analytics that help us understand when someone is actually engaged and learning. That's terrific. And learning helps solve so many challenges with both upskilling uh, to enable people to propel their careers forward, propel their companies towards goals, and their SaaS partners to make sure that they're helping to deliver value all around and getting everyone on the same page. Right. So that's terrific. Angela, thanks so much for sharing so generously today. What's the best way for someone to reach out to you if they want to connect or have any questions? Are you, is LinkedIn a good place for you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Great. And if they want to learn a little bit more about what you're working on at uh, TapClix, is there a particular resource that you send them to follow on social media or the website? Or um, Yeah, I would say to go to tapclix.com, take a look around. Um, we certainly have an academy just linked at the top there. So you could come learn with me how to use TapClix. That's terrific. Angela, thanks so much for joining me today on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I wish you all the best and definitely look forward to keeping in touch. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Joshua. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. And they forget that the actual product that the user is coming there for is the content. And if that isn't amazing, you know, there's so much content out there in the world that yours will get lost. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized podcast, and I have a very special guest here with me today. I'm welcoming Eric Peters. Eric is a senior growth product manager at HubSpot, primarily working on HubSpot Academy and the newly to be launched HubSpot Network. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be here. Likewise. So I think the first place that would be super helpful to start is from the perspective of someone that may have a little bit of familiarity with HubSpot, but doesn't know much about HubSpot Academy. Can you walk us through how you got to your current role, how your team is structured, and, and what you do primarily at HubSpot? Sure, sure. So the history of HubSpot Academy is pretty interesting at HubSpot. Uh, as you probably know, if you're familiar with HubSpot, uh, inbound marketing and the inbound methodology is uh, kind of a core tenet of how HubSpot markets itself, how HubSpot teaches its users how to market themselves, uh, et cetera. And early on in the, the early days of HubSpot, uh, folks who were there before me decided to make a inbound certification that taught people how to do inbound marketing uh, and uh, kind of assessed how well they learned that skill and, and learned that information. Um, that course and that certification was actually initially only for customers. And you know, in the spirit of inbound, uh, they kind of let, you know, it go open to the world. So it became kind of this free and open to all certification. And it wasn't necessarily the best 
course on SEO or the best course on content marketing, right? Like HubSpot's content teams are incredible and they do try to create like the best content on the internet. But at the time that course, what was really special about it was that it connected the dots between otherwise kind of disparate marketing tactics. Like it really allowed you to see, okay, here's how your email marketing strategy connects to your content marketing strategy and that connects to your SEO strategy. And so from there, we started to, you know, kind of build this demand for HubSpot Academy content, which became this online learning self-service uh, enablement platform really for HubSpot. Uh, it initially was there for customers and partners, as I said, to teach them how to sell and service HubSpot or teach them how to use HubSpot. Uh, but we started to see more and more value as an acquisition channel and as a demand generation function for HubSpot Academy, because at the same time, this whole wave of online course providers was growing, like Coursera was reaching these astronomical size viewership. And uh, so we kind of split the content teams up into acquisition content or uh, just general, like how to do content marketing, how to do email marketing, doesn't necessarily teach you how to do it in HubSpot, but just teaches you how to do it really well. And then we had obviously software training and partner enablement training and things like that. Um, and so the platform kind of grew from there and rather than having one specific mission for HubSpot, it just became like this online learning platform that teams at HubSpot could use to reach their missions. So then, you know, we started really focusing on how developers build and extend HubSpot. And so all this developer content sort of came out in the woodwork there. And we started focusing on how we, you know, teach how we bring HubSpot into like university settings and enable professors at universities to teach HubSpot. And so all this new programming and functionality came for, to support that initiative. So the HubSpot Academy kind of platform is really just an online course provider that's really built into HubSpot. And what's really unique about it is that it has HubSpot attached to it. If you kind of flip the script and say, well, HubSpot Academy is this online course provider out in the world. It's the only online course provider that has a whole mid-market SMB software platform attached to it where you can go play around and use the free tools and try you know, what you're learning and apply what you're learning in a you know, relatively safe kind of sandbox environment. So that's kind of the story of how HubSpot Academy grew up to be what it is today. And yeah, it still supports a lot of different functions for HubSpot. Yeah, it's amazing to see in the roughly 10 years or so since it morphed from uh, Inbound Marketing University and Content Camp and all the different courses originally for end users and customers and partners, how broad the catalog has grown. And that alone must have presented some great opportunities and some great challenges around scaling. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the biggest challenge we have today is that that library and that catalog keeps growing. And so enabling users to find the right content for them is kind of my team's core mission, right? Like when they first sign up, what's the right content that someone who's in marketing at a company that this, this size and has this challenge should take first. Um, and that's, that's a pretty difficult puzzle to solve. Yeah. I imagine because most of my role over the last decade or so was working with startups, scale ups, small businesses, companies where they're either outsourcing or very, very small marketing team, a, a couple dozen employees. And it's so different than the context of someone that's working in enterprise marketing where they're just dedicated to search or just dedicated to uh, paid or just dedicated to social or content or something like that. Absolutely. So the first big question I wanted to get your take on is for someone that is brand new to growth marketing and brand new to product-led growth uh, to PLG, what advice would you offer them to start regardless of whether they're working in the context of customer education or just more broadly for, for a SaaS or, or a tech company? Um, so I think when I first started getting into product like growth and growth marketing, the, the most important thing I did was start talking to customers and really get, you know, good qualitative research. You know, I think in growth, particularly when you go into growth or product led growth, you tend to have really good analytic skills and you lean on those skills and you build dashboards and you, you know, model out, you know, behaviors and and the metric side of the puzzle tends to be like the natural fit for a growth marketer. But the qualitative research side, where you're talking to people and you're doing more like anthropological research and asking them, you know, why did you do this? Or, you know, there's this, this concept of the five whys. Why did you sign up for HubSpot Academy? Okay, to get a, a 
you know, to learn the tool better? Why do you want to learn the tool better to get, you know, better in my job? Why do you want to get better in your job to get a raise? Why do you want to get a raise to take my family on vacation? Ah, okay, that's why you wanted to take Sign Up Ropes on Academy because you want to take your family on vacation. When you get into the deep kind of understandings of user motivations, that's an incredibly valuable uh, perspective to gain and enables all of the rest of those skills that you have as a growth marketer, product like growth professional to really come, come into fruition. It's super interesting too, to dig into the motivations. And when I think about like the golden circle and starting with why, and really getting deep into essentially like personas, which I first learned about personas from the predecessor to Academy back from some of the earliest HubSpot marketing hires and this whole idea of putting yourself in the user's shoes and their perspective. And I guess that was a huge part of figuring out how to scale the, the courses, right? Yeah, and it's so important because you know you can look at your your dashboards and your reports and see here's what ten thousand people did this week or here's what a thousand people did this week, but to go and talk to Betty, who you know whose boss told her to take this course in HubSpot Academy because they want to evaluate HubSpot, and that's that's a totally different type of information. And yes, it's a sample size of one, but it's still an incredibly like rich experience worth informing you know product decisions and, and experience decisions later on. In my life, prior to learning about inbound marketing, I was doing probably what you'd consider early generation digital and internet marketing and online marketing in the early 2000s. And around that time, a lot of software companies were pre-SaaS and struggled a lot with fragmentation within such the broad category of small businesses. Has that been something that's challenged you as well uh, with scaling the growth of HubSpot Academy? Uh yeah, I, I would, I mean, especially with the diversity of the catalog and how many different kind of jobs to be done HubSpot Academy has now, kind of splitting out these different personas, thinking about, you know, what is the main job to be done for each of these types of people, that's really become like the name of the game for us. And, and doing it in a programmatic way that shows the right content to the right person at the right time. Um, attributing someone's experience in HubSpot Academy to, you know, downstream impact, right? Like did someone who took the email marketing certification in HubSpot Academy send better emails in HubSpot? That is like one of the, the biggest challenges and, and the kind of hardest causation correlation puzzle for us to solve. Um, we have a pretty good idea of, you know, well, good users self-educate, not necessarily self-educators are good users, but uh, those, are, those are the kind of puzzles that my team at HubSpot thinks about all, all the time and tries to solve. It's really fascinating to hear that perspective as well, because from leading a HubSpot user group, a hug for four years, that was one thing that we never really were able to get a great handle on either, aside from just surveys of people that attended the meetings. That's something that the HubSpot partner ecosystem has struggled with also connecting the dots on all of this. So I'm really curious to hear from the perspective of a product-led growth expert, how you've been able to use features within the platform to be able to know that you're on the right track with moving the needle on some of these metrics aside from just like a basic NPS survey. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, largely a matter of enabling the content creator to, to learn what key metrics they want their content to improve. So the person who created that email marketing certification, give them the, the ability to measure their cohort of learners and how they perform in the software platform compared to other learners. Um, because, you know, from my perspective of looking at all 500 courses and lessons in HubSpot Academy, like I simply cannot do that. So I, I need to enable the content creator to take it upon themselves to see that they're having the impact in the customer experience that they're looking for. Yeah, just the scale and the volume is just have to be enormous. I remember a time back several years ago when most of the courses had practicums yeah. and the professors, the, the content creators were literally grading the work. You know, somebody said, go build a landing page and make it build these best practices. And they'd have to go and manually review that. And you could see that just that wasn't going to scale. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's been a lot of scaling. I mean, particularly across different languages, uh, different, you know, internationally, that it's been a big challenge to, to scale up Sword Academy and enable it to be a self-service platform. Yeah, I've noticed just a ton of growth in the last two or three years around that also in multilingual HubSpot Academy courses, multilingual HubSpot Academy professors. Has that presented unique challenges in scaling the catalog and the engine? 
Oh, it's incredibly challenging. Um, I mean, for instance, so take the way we teach inbound marketing is like largely how to do digital marketing in North America. If we translate it to Spanish, then we're still teaching North American marketing in Spanish. So do they, does the user expect uh, you know, digital marketing in Mexico or digital marketing in these other parts of the world that speak Spanish, or do they just expect North American marketing in Spanish? Do we, you know, so that's like how the gradations of localization, is it fully localized? Do we teach, you know, this is how you do digital marketing in Japan, or do we teach, or, or is it just translation? And it's, this is how we do digital marketing in America, but taught in Japanese. And so just knowing that that spectrum exists opens up this enormous, uh, you know, challenge of, of saying, what, how far do we go, right? Is, can we teach how to do digital marketing in Japan in, in Japanese and still you know, bring the HubSpot software platform into that course and enable those users in Japan to do Japanese digital marketing? Like I think the, the, the subject matter offers the biggest complexity um, in the whole localization puzzle for sure. What advice would you offer to someone that's fairly far along in the journey? Maybe they have product-led growth is still relatively new, but just doing uh, growth marketing and, and product management for a SaaS company, probably five, 10 years into their career, maybe they've gone through an especially challenging time over the last six or 12 months and they're looking to reset. Um, what did peer advice would you offer to uh, someone in that role to help them get back on track? I would say, you know, go back to the fundamentals. Think about the, um, the customer of your customer, particularly in B2B. And this is something Dharmesh Shah, our co-founder, uh, always says is that you know if you solve for the customer of your customer, you're never going to do your customer wrong. And so, in HubSpot Academy, if I think about you know who is the end you end customer of HubSpot Academy, it might be you know so for instance, if we have a student in HubSpot Academy, are they the actual customer or is the person who's going to hire that student the actual customer or is the end user of that? customer, the actual customer, like how do I think through the chain of value to make sure that the person who is experiencing this digital experience that I've built gets the value out of it that they should get out of it. So I think going back to the fundamentals and solving for the customer is key. I think it's so easy to want to jump on the new trend, the new channel, right? Like we saw this whole clubhouse, like enormous, you know, trend happen. And it's kind of like, you know, petered out a little bit. And the same thing happened with Snapchat when Snapchat first came out. Same things I'm sure happening with TikTok. Uh, but I think if I were to do a reset in growth marketing, I would say like, go back to the fundamentals, know your customer really, really, really well. Like be able to talk to them like they're a friend. Know, you know, the create digital experiences that are going to exceed their expectations so that they're willing to tell their friends about it. So they feel like they found something special. Um, and they feel like they're an insider who wants to tell people about this great book that they just found. Uh, those fundamentals, I think, go a long way. And I think people who are you know, five years, 10 years in tend to lose sight of them. I'm just keeping peeling back the layers until you say, OK, I think I'm at the source right now. But oh, let me ask and double check. Nope, there's actually another layer deeper here to get closer to the actual user. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, and there's something I think that happens at particularly at bigger companies where you tend to have more budget, more people working on things. Um, you know, having come from the startup world before I joined HubSpot, when there's budget constraints and people constraints, and it's just you and you have to figure out the most exponential tactic that you can find, and you can't try out six different things. When, you know, with a team, it's just you. That the creativity that that those constraints um, enable and force. Go a long way, and so I also, you know, tend to try to challenge people to say, like, what could, what would we do if we were at a startup, and this is the one play that we needed to like save our cash flow and just like completely save us from going bankrupt. Uh, and those types of brainstorms tend to be really productive. Has that shaped your thinking and overall approach to the product roadmap when you look at over the past three or five years, like HubSpot for startups, uh, the starter edition of the virus hubs? Has that fundamentally shaped how you've approached some of the academy roadmap, the academy course catalog as well? Certainly. Well, it's, it's definitely opened up the audience, right? So whereas HubSpot was this kind of 200 to 2000 person segment, it, you know, when we open it up to the one to 10 group, 
uh, in that starter segment, it's certainly made for a whole new world of content in HubSpot Academy, where we were not just like teaching people a new way of doing digital marketing where they might have already done digital marketing. Now we were like teaching them the fundamentals of digital marketing and what search engine optimization even means, uh, or you know what clicking on an ad does uh, behind the scenes for for a marketer. So I would say the discovery patterns of content of our of our users in HubSpot Academy changed dramatically because it, it then became about putting things in their language and say and explaining to them, okay, you want to get more people to find your business? Is that what you're after? It's not, do you want to learn demand generation and lead generation? It's, you know, are you looking for a replacement for the Excel spreadsheet you've been using to track all of your employees rather than a new CRM system that can, you know, manage your contacts. So how does the process work taking us a little bit behind the curtain on when you discover a need versus how far you're planning out a course versus how much the creator, how much the academy professor is planning out what the curriculum is going to look like? So the content creators have a very sophisticated process at this point, and they have a lot of constraints based on, uh, you know, what they can teach that is not going to like go out of date extremely quickly. Like so many marketing topics are out of date in a year because, you know, we wanted to teach Snapchat when Snapchat was really hot or something. Um, but their process is, you know, starts with this backwards, uh, backwards plan. Here's what I want the, the user to learn. And then they kind of fill it out with, you know, experts and do a ton of research and, and talk to a lot of people about, you know, what are the key components? And then instructional design is, is a whole different form of content creation that they are really, really impressively good at. Um, and so our job, my team's job is to enable them to get that content into the app and in front of viewers who are particularly looking for that content uh, as easily as possible. And the content creator experience hasn't been something we've always necessarily focused on at HubSpot because it's been a relatively small group, but it's growing like incredibly fast. Now there's dozens and dozens of content creators internally at HubSpot who are all focused on different areas of the product or of the ecosystem even. Um, and then there are the you know, language variants of all of those. So um, I guess the, the, the short answer is that it's it's very complex and they do have to like take into account what, what trends are evolving uh, and they kind of grade the content based on this like evergreen score of is this going to go out of date in the next year or is this going to be a you know two to three year horizon when we need to update this next? And they actually have an SLA for keeping 80% of the content up to date at any given time, which is, I think, probably one of the hardest things to do in customer education when you have a SaaS software platform because you have the product team updating the UI and the software constantly and you need these courses to kind of stay up to date and uh, reflect the, the latest edition of the software at any given time. Yeah, that's something as a big consumer of the Academy courses I've noticed as well over time. Originally, uh, there were some certifications that were requiring an annual certification. Then I guess at some point, probably three, four years ago, it went to the point where the product uh, based certifications based on HubSpot software were annual recertifications and the uh, product agnostic were every two years, but just in general, the whole idea of having shorter videos so they're easier, more modular to be able to update, I imagine, made a big difference in keeping yes. keeping current. Yeah, that was that was a, a win for content creators and a win for end users because end users tend to give us feedback that they want short clips, right? They want to be able to watch this on the bus on the way to work. Um, so great for them. But then obviously, yeah, content creators have much easier time swapping in and out videos when they're 30 seconds as opposed to 20 minutes. Do you look at a specific journey that a typical user goes through? You think about the typical, at the macro level, the inbound methodology of your personas and you have your journey. Is there a journey that an academy user would go through that's comparable to like awareness consideration decision or start middle and um, a kind of scenario, beginner, intermediate, advanced, any, any I mean, frameworks like that? I, I, any marketer, I guess, product like growth professional would, would hope that there is like some typical flow. It's, it's there are so many flows though. Like there's so many ways into Academy, even just if you're an existing customer and you hear about Academy from your 
customer success manager versus you're a student and your professor assigns HubSpot Academy to you in your class. Like those flows are vastly different. We have a ton, we have thousands and thousands of people signing up for HubSpot Academy every month who don't even realize that HubSpot offers software. So how do you introduce the concept of software to this cohort and then introduce HubSpot Academy to that cohort? Um, the, the like, I guess the really exciting flow or I don't know, I, I don't have any favorites, I guess, but like one that I've worked on the most is the, somebody hears about HubSpot Academy because they searched content marketing and they want to learn about content marketing. They sign up for the content marketing certification. And they have a great experience taking the content marketing certification. Hopefully it impresses them. And then they come to realize that HubSpot offers software and this software can enable them to do that strategy reasonably you know, easily and all in one system. And then they go and buy HubSpot software and then they are that much more likely to be a good long retaining customer because they came in through the HubSpot Academy door and they know where to go when they need support and help later on. And that flow is the flow that you know I have worked on for years and would love to uh, you know, go smoothly for as many people as I possibly can, but there are so many ins and outs of that uh, experience. And like I said, the, the partner flow, the developer flow, the student flow, the customer, they're all, they're all there. And so at the end of the day, what we needed to just focus on is creating an online learning platform where we our KPIs are how many people finished the course that they started. doesn't matter what language they took it in or what they were learning about or where they came from. Uh, or how big their company is, or what their job title is, but did they finish it? Did they did did we optimize for knowledge transfer? Um, and that's how we can solve for all of these different use cases for HubSpot Academy. What do you see as the biggest mistake that people make when they're getting started with product led growth in a customer education framework? They they tend to, especially people who want to talk to me, um, they tend to talk, think about the tech and the product and they, you know, about where to host the videos or how to, you know, what learning management system should we use or should we care about gamification and badging? And they forget that the actual product that the user is coming there for is the content. And if that isn't amazing, you know, there's so much content out there in the world that yours will get lost. So focus in on the content first and then worry about the tech and the experience after. If the content is good, They'll watch it anywhere you put it. You can throw it on YouTube. You can, you know, put it on TikTok. They'll, they'll find it and value it. But if you focus too much on the like digital experience of, you know, like the HubSpot Academy application, and I'm throwing myself under the bus because that's the part of HubSpot Academy that I work on and my team owns. But uh, that's the, that's so secondary to how good the actual content is. And my team wouldn't exist if there weren't thousands of people coming in to take those courses because those courses are as good as they are. Do you find there is much of a use case for people that are listening to the courses as opposed to watching it? Like, for example, one of the ways that I'm able to keep and maintain the 330, 31 certifications, whatever it is, is when I'm on the elliptical, I'm watching it on my phone. But when I'm going for a walk around the neighborhood, it's in my pocket and I'm listening to the courses. Do you get people that go back and forth between being video consumers and audio consumers? Or Yeah, certainly. And I think with the content creators, these days, when the content creators go to you know write their scripts, they they try to up they try to make sure that you can listen to the course and still learn just as much. Some content, some topics are not going to lend themselves to that. If, if you know we're showing you how to do something in the software, you probably need to look at how look at the the video. But um, you know, from an accessibility standpoint, from a mobility standpoint, like we now have HubSpot Academy in like embedded into the HubSpot mobile app. Um, we want people to be able to watch courses on the go, watch them while they're on their, you know, elliptical and, and do all that stuff. So part of that is content formats and, and making sure the script says everything that the user needs to hear in addition to showing what they need to see. But also it's you know putting that content in a format that's accessible, whether you're on a train, whether you have internet or not. Uh, those are some things we've thought about too. It's terrific. The final area I wanted to get your input on is where this is all headed next. If you think about from the perspective of someone that uses a, a go-to-market strategy that's heavily aligned with product-led growth in a customer education, customer success kind of framework for a SaaS company, what do you see going on right now where we're going to look back 24 months from now, 36 months from now, and realize that there was something huge that was at work that was fundamentally changing the whole challenge and the opportunity around this? 
So I think particularly when it comes to customer education or in SaaS, simulation and the ability to learn by doing what you're learning is a much more uh, comprehensive way to learn anything, any skill. Right. If we can take you from watching videos about flying a plane to virtual reality simulation of actually flying a plane, those are extremely different learning experiences, and one will have a much deeper connection uh, and, and re retention of that skill. So, like I was saying earlier, because we have HubSpot attached to HubSpot Academy, I really want to like lean into that and uh, bring people into the software, have them do stuff there, and then assess their skills in the software rather than teach, show them videos and have them. Uh, you know, just kind of retain videos and you do a multiple choice quiz. For instance, we had like last April when we were at this like peak of the pandemic, we had something like we awarded 40,000 certifications and each certification takes 30 minutes to pass that exam on average. Like obviously there's a big variance, but on average there's 30 minutes. And I did the math and I was like, we just took two years and two and a quarter years worth of humanity's time to have them go take multiple choice questions. There's got to be a better way to assess their skills, you know, at the, in some programmatic automatic way. And, you know, there is, we can do that in the software and we can have people go, you know, learn something and then apply it in the software and then assess whether they learned it by what they did in the software rather than just take multiple choices. Yet. So I think that's the future of online learning, the simulation and going and applying what you're learning and, and actually doing it rather than just, watching it and hearing about it. So that might be trickier to do on the treadmill, sorry to say. <laughs> Depends how much you can get done on the uh, <laughs> being able to pinch and zoom around, but yeah, it's very interesting to hear a greater emphasis coming on application and being able to implement and greater retention around that. Right. That's terrific. Eric, if anyone has any questions on anything you talked about in today's episode or wants to reach out and, and connect with you, what's the best way to reach you? Is LinkedIn the best channel? Uh, LinkedIn is great or Twitter. Uh, I'm Eric Peter Zero on Twitter. Uh, both are great. And what's a good first place for someone to start that's brand new to, that's never heard of HubSpot Academy before? Do you have a favorite first course that you'd send them to? I always recommend the inbound certification. It was the first one for a reason and it sets the stage for everything else. So it's terrific. So I'll make sure to include a link to that as well. Eric, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been super informative to hear from the perspective of what goes on behind the scenes and scaling and, and growing HubSpot Academy and the way you've been able to use it as a growth engine for uh, beating HubSpot's bigger picture goals. Absolutely happy to join and thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. It's so funny when we were doing it, like that was our goal, but we had no idea like how big it was going to turn out to be. You know, we just had like really strong mission and vision and team principles. And we were such a cohesive gelled team. Um, we just gelled so well. And I think that allowed us to like have trust in one another. Welcome to the B2B Digitized Podcast where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hey, it's Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized Podcast. I have a very special guest here with me today. I'm welcoming Sarah Bedrick. I've known Sarah for many, many years, going back to her days at HubSpot Academy. Sarah is now involved as a co-founder of SaaS Academy Advisors and Thrive Consulting, Thrive Coaching. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Joshua. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, the first place I usually like to start with most guess is if you can give us a little bit of your journey, how you got to where you currently are. Did you always know you were going to end up on this path when you were growing up and thinking about going off to school or did this just kind of happen through 
different circumstances and, and how, how are, what are you working on specifically today? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So I think I was one of the lucky few who grew up knowing what I wanted to do. Um, as like, as young as I can remember, I was always starting little businesses, obviously the lemonade stand. And in uh, second grade, I had an origami, uh, origami paper business and just a common theme throughout, like everything I've done in my career has been entrepreneurial and starting something from scratch. Um, but a lot of like the intricacies of what I've done, um, helping to start the HubSpot Academy team and scale that over six and a half years, um, co-founding an HR startup, um, a lot of that, like I didn't plan out, like it just happened and just following the breadcrumbs of joy, if you will. Um, and that's really led me to where I am today, which is kind of combining all of that and putting it together and now I'm working with two former HubSpot Academy team members and we're advising software companies on how to build their own and scale their own academy or university initiatives. Yeah, I saw that. It sounds like a fantastic idea just given how rapidly digital transformation has accelerated during the pandemic and how it's so much more important to be able to help people get more value faster and being able to do that without necessarily the benefit of being physically in the same classroom. Yes, absolutely. And just to add on to that, because I think that's a great point. Um, <clears throat> building an academy or a university initiative like is, is something that all of the world class businesses today are doing or have done. And so many more people are entering this, um, taking on this approach. But it's still so new that there's not a lot of people with the experience or the knowledge and the know how to get it done. Um, and so like, what we saw from HubSpot Academy was so powerful for the business, but it was exponentially greater for all of the people who went through our training and were able to level up for free, get promotions, change jobs, like just leveling up their entire life. And that's really what we're so excited to help other businesses do for their uh, learners, their users, their people, and um, yeah, their industry. Yeah, I always with leading the HubSpot user group over the years, I always, as I told people about HubSpot Academy and specifically about the training and certification programs, I usually said it's somehow in the context that if you have a friend or family member who's the dean of a business school and you're currently selling a digital marketing program where people are taking a second mortgage on the house, you're going to be very nervous when you see just how amazing the free content is that, that comes out of a program, academy like that. Totally. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and thank you. <laughs> No, it's terrific. terrific. Um, so given all of that for someone that is relatively new to digital marketing, that's relatively new to customer education and customer success, what advice would you give someone that's just getting started with all this on how to uh, get the ball rolling? Yeah, sure. Um, I personally believe one of the most impactful things for my own career and for the, car the careers of those who are around me who have been ex like tremendously successful has been having mentors. Um, and I don't think like, I think when you say the word mentor, a lot of people think like go out and ask people to be your mentor. Um, but what I mean more so is finding like your own council of experts, your own um, go-to group of people that you turn to when you have business questions or when you have career related questions or when you need help um, working through a problem with maybe your manager um, or deciding on a career path and i think um, having people that you can turn to that have either done this before or doing it at the same time as you is such a fantastic way to learn um, and then i think also like reading tons of books and blogs from people that you want to emulate their career or emulate them in some capacity. Um, so like Ariana Huffington or maybe Oprah or maybe Katie Burke, um, finding people that you really aspire to follow and, and just learning from them from afar. Um, I mean, it'd be so hard to get one of them as a mentor. It'd be, uh, I don't want to say impossible because nothing's impossible, but it'd be really challenging. So you can still learn from them, read their books, read their articles online. Um, and I think that's an excellent way to get started because you have the council around you who are with you for where you are right now. And then the inspirational leaders that you can learn from um, and continue to, to develop your own models and um, just mindsets from. 
Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It is, it's so much just the reading is that when you think about the bond that you have with someone when they're consuming video content, gosh, there's got to be tens of thousands of people that went through courses that you created while you're at HubSpot that feel like in a lot of ways that you mentored them. Oh, that's really, <laughs> really kind of you to say. Yeah, and I, and I, I think... Um, yeah, video is so, so, so important for business owners, for people getting started um, and sharing your own journey. And I think it's such a great way to expedite or accel accelerate the trust that you have with people as well. So it helps them to get to know who you are, what you're like, and um, if it's someone that you want to do business with or learn from. I've always found that over the years is that when someone that you're having an initial meeting with a new customer or prospect or something, and they've already consumed hours and hours of your content and heard you speak. It's like you know, a, a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the nervousness, a lot of the, um, has already been done. A lot of the heavy lifting's already been done. That's the power of great content marketing. That's the power of great training, great uh, academy. And um, when I look around in the SaaS industry or the wider like technology industry, everyone still points to the amazing work and foundation that you and the team built at HubSpot Academy as like the world class gold standard for what everyone wants to emulate. <laughs> That's so beautiful. And thank you for saying that. And it's so funny when we were doing it, like that was our goal, but we had no idea like how big it was going to turn out to be. You know, we just had like really strong mission and vision and team principles. And we were such a cohesive gelled team. Um, we just gelled so well. And I think that allowed us to like have trust in one another, like an improv team, you know, like improv is so great because one person can take a big risk and it can fail miserably, but they know that their other improv team members are there to like take that big fail and turn it into an even bigger success than it would have been otherwise. Um, and so I think that is part of the reason that led to our um, just, yeah, really unique success. Did you find that most of the people who had joined the team came from a, either a customer service, like tech support or customer success kind of background, or did some people successfully jump into that context without having spent several months or a couple of years learning to walk in the shoes Gosh. of the customers? Yeah, that's such a good question. Our initial team members, like some of us had business backgrounds or had worked in software, but then a lot of people that we hired didn't. Um, one of the team members, Rachel Goodman Moore, came from like a neuroscience background. Like she had, she was a, a researcher, a scientist. Somebody else had studied history at Yale. I mean, it's a great school, but had studied history, right? And so everyone had like this unique perspective that they were able to bring. And I think that's also something that's so beautiful is when you take um, history or science or researching really well, and you're able to intersect those fields and those learnings with what we were doing to make what we were doing even more successful. It's a lot of schools of thought too, on like when you're hiring on a sales team, a lot of times they try to match the context of like understanding a certain business model, understanding a certain size of the purchase size of the client. I imagine there's something to be said for that as well with having some relevant career experience to really understand the persona on a much deeper level, even before you start getting into planning curriculum. Yeah. Yeah, certainly for sure. So for someone that is in this role that has been running an academy that's been running a customer success, a customer education program for several years, and is trying to figure out what to do to reboot and get back on track. Maybe they've just been through a rough year or two. Maybe there's been a lot of turnover within their company. What would you do to advise someone to help them refine their way, refine, reignite their passion and uh, help figure out where they should go next with a program like that? Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to make sure. So you mean like um, an individual who's leading some sort of academy initiative to get that back on track, not like them personally. Okay. Or, or someone that's working on a team like that. Yeah. That's faced a lot of struggles. Maybe the, the company is in a, say, for example, they were selling SaaS to the restaurant industry uh, that just that faced a really brutal 2020 or hospitality or something similar to that. Um, and because of that, they felt a downstream effect because their uh, customer base is so concentrated. Yeah. Yeah, I think the most important thing, and this isn't just even in this situation, this is just in life, is having, um, making sure that you have the right mindset. Like when you go through really challenging times, your business or you personally can be really easy to get down on yourself and get lost and get into this mindset like of 
some people will call it like saboteur brain and things aren't going to work out or I don't see any solutions. Like I don't know what to do next. And that's a really disempowering state. So I'd say like first and foremost, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> first and foremost, I think really evaluating your mindset um, and making sure that it is one that's empowering, one that is compelling and exciting for you. And I think more tangibly after that is like doing an audit, like seeing seeing where you actually are today. Um, I mean, for the last 18 months or more now, like since the start of COVID, for a lot of people, things didn't shape out how they planned. And so looking at like, what did I want to happen? What actually happened? And what's the learning here? And those little like learnings are like nuggets of wisdom that you can look back to and keep with you for now and for ever into the future because things are going to continue to change at a rapid pace. Um, so just learning from what you wanted to happen, what actually happened and, and how, like why it shook out that way. Um, and then I think again, learning from others, like, is there someone that is really doing an excellent job at something you want to do? How can you pull them in as an advisor, as a mentor, as a friend to just have a one-off call and help, um, you know, soak in their positive energy and also learn from them and like what they're doing, their mistakes. So you can take your learning curve from this down to here and suck it all, you know, shrink it all the way down. Do you yeah. find in those situations, both looking through the shoes of others, as well as even through your own career, like we all have these inning, we have these uh, chapters, we have these innings, we have all these different roles that we have, and eventually it all rolls together and what makes us who we are today. Do you think there's any clues in the past that help us find where we're going next? Oh my gosh, I could go on this forever. This is like something I absolutely <laughs> love. So um, as you know, I'm also, you mentioned Thrive Coaching. So I'm also a career and life coach. And so like this has been for the past four years, something I've been deeply obsessed with because when I was trying to leave HubSpot or when I was like deciding whether I wanted to leave, you know, on paper, everything was really fantastic. And um, how could I leave such a great company? And I had like, I had built this great team with like these great people and we were doing such great things. Like why would anybody in their right mind leave? Um, and I actually got the help of a career coach. And I, you know, from that, oh my gosh, so, so much powerful insights about myself and my learning and my growth came from that. And what I didn't realize was that just like we do in life, um, in work settings, we also pick up like career baggage, if you will. Um, so maybe an example is like your boss undermines you in front of people you manage, or you get a really bad review and you're expecting a great review, or you get fired randomly. Um, all of that starts to create this mindset that you develop. And if you don't complete that, like process what's happened, at least the negative, if you don't probably the positive too, but if you don't process what's happened to you, um, and you don't complete your past, you end up making decisions on the paths that you take in life based off of like an, uh, an incomplete past or through the lens of like what had happened to you. So yeah, I think it's really important for us as individuals, as well as professionals, parents, wives, husbands, um, team members on a sports team to just be really aware of like the things that pop up that are emotionally charged or even like emotionally traumatic and use that to like make us a more stronger team member, partner, um, decision maker, business owner, <laughs> marketer, whatever it might be. Yeah, that adds a whole new dimension to this as well, because you not only have your work family that's heavily involved in oftentimes infusing over into your life outside of work, but now with with so many people working from home, um, at least for the last year and a half, maybe for at least for the next uh, few months, it's like every day is bring your kids to work day <laughs> and, bring, yes. and bring your spouse to work day. So they get to see the good, the bad, the not so good. And yeah, yeah, bring, absolutely. Fortunately, my kiddo's at daycare right now, so he won't be popping in, but maybe next time. <laughs> and then there'll be that period of time when they get curious about what you do if, they're, if he's not ready. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes he'll come over here and be like, mommy work, I work. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he, he like knows what work is. And <laughs> you know, he, he wants to work now. What is this? <laughs> my 10 year old started a YouTube channel about 
two years ago and he's been doing it. I don't know. I think he's been taking a break for the last several months, but it's really interesting that they're digi- totally digital native. <laughs> he's never known life without a tablet or, <laughs> or stream. Oh my gosh. Can we just acknowledge 10 years old and he started his own YouTube channel? Like this generation, you know, oh. we better watch out for them. Wanted to show his friend. He was watching a lot of videos on how to get better at Roblox and Fortnite, and he wanted to show his friends how to get better at Roblox. <laughs> so he started. That's awesome. Recording his own like stuff. and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting. We had to watch a little bit carefully too, because a lot of the gamers that were creating the videos were teens and twenty somethings, and some of them are a little less filtered than they should mm-hmm. be. It's not. It's not all Disney and PBS down. So yeah, it's been. Uh, it's been an interesting part of it too. Good on you. Yeah. Good on you. Sarah, how would your advice change for how to approach this for existing customers, like a customer success onboarding framework, as opposed to using the training and the education as a lead generation or revenue growth engine with prospects? Yeah. Yeah. And so I. Yeah. I remember within yeah. the early days of like inbound marketing university and HubSpot Academy, a, a lot of it, a lot of the training was originally focused on HubSpot customers that already had software. And then at some point there started to be all this great training that was completely platform agnostic. Um, yeah, no, that's a really, really great point. And I think, I mean, there's actually, I think I saw something on this recently. Um, Actually, that was more focused on like, how do you know if you should do self-paced versus um, or monetized versus free? Uh, But yeah, there's a lot of things to consider. Like there's a lot of inputs to decide. Um, What we see and what we work with mostly is like a lot of people who are trying to improve their customer retention, their product adoption. And that usually starts from like the customer success angle. Um, And so a lot of people start there um just because they also i mean there's so many different top line and bottom line metrics that can be improved from building an academy or university initiative um like support ticket deflection and uh helping the csms manage even more logos or more accounts because they're able to better better self-service and better educate themselves um but yeah, most of what we're seeing is a lot of people are, most companies are starting with uh, the CSM angle and then they start, and this is what happened with HubSpot Academy. And then they start seeing, well, wait a minute, we're now in a more mature market. We're uh, like a more mature business. Like we can start focusing on the brand and the larger industry focus or product agnostic, as you said, training. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's what we did on on the HubSpot Academy team. We started all on product. It was like, the executives gave us a goal of focusing on the customers and leads just started coming or yeah, like leads just started coming into our classes and we realized, wait a minute, there's a huge opportunity to just bring this education to the greater market. And that's when we really started focusing on um, educating like all, all marketing professionals on inbound. Yeah. I remember we went through a similar type of aha moment with the user groups where they're originally supposed to be primarily for customers. And then they'd say, wait, I want to invite my friend. I want to invite my boss. I want to invite my brother-in-law, whatever. And uh, there were so many people that were getting so much value out of it, even if they were just kind of sort of thinking about getting the software in the future and you know, it's the same kind of thing. So then ultimately it's up to the company to decide their priorities, whether they care more about customer activation and retention and uh, helping to drive more expansion and usage of a platform or whether they're looking to drive more awareness and growth for an easier sales process or ideally being able to rub your belly and pat your head at the same time. Totally. And I would say don't do what I did, which was when I co-founded Compt, coming from HubSpot Academy, I looked around the HR um, the HR industry and was like, wow, there hasn't been much innovation here. And SHRM is like the st- so society um, for human resources management, like they were still the go-to for all HR learning and um, certifications. And I was like, wow, there needs to be some like newer energy and newer blood in here. And so I built Comp University. And as a new business that had, we had taken a a funding approach where we weren't taking on a lot of like large rounds of um, investment. And so we didn't have like we ran really lean. We didn't have a ton of money to invest in something like that. And we weren't a well-known business. And there was also no one else doing what we were doing, which was stipends. 
And so it was such a brand new concept, like employee stipends, like, what is this? And so to launch something as big as a comp university um, that was focused on educating the industry was just a, an enormous challenge. So like coming out of the gate, that wasn't, you know, that was a quick learning on my part. I skinned my knees there quite a bit and was like, all right, that didn't work out how I wanted to. Fortunately, we didn't spend a ton of money or time um, and really helped to shape like what I ended up doing next, which was way more successful than um, trying to come out the gate with an academy. It's a tricky, deceptive thing to be able to navigate all of this because the out-of-pocket cost for like what you need with equipment and software is so absurdly nominal that, um, especially out of the gate, that you can really get faked out. I think it was Seth Godin, one of his books years ago, maybe it was Lynchpin or something like that, where he talked about that the factory is now your laptop. You know, everyone can own the factory for $1,200, $1,500. And uh, now what do you do to differentiate? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic point. Wow. When you think about it that way, it's like, yeah, it can be deceptive how easy it would be. Yeah, I mean, slides in a Zoom account and in theory, you can start teaching classes. But yeah, it's a matter of like how to organize it, how it serves the company objectives and not being pulled in too many different directions. And then, okay, now once you're maxed out, you know, what does the team look like? What does the next steps look like? And how are you going to measure to make sure that you're really making the progress you think you want to be? Yes, yes, yeah like industry maturation or your products, like your product's brand awareness. There's a lot of things at play to decide. Yeah. Smart goals, right? <laughs> <laughs> now that the, they morphed into like uh, more broadly, the OKRs, like objectives and key results. Key results and every, yeah. every, everyone so many times wants to measure the stuff that is difficult to measure and sometimes impossible to measure, or at least with the current technology that exists today. And some that's sometimes the most difficult part is that the stakeholders, investors, and board is just trying to come up with a number. And sometimes it's really, really hard to always find that number spe specifically, and you end up going to what's easier to measure. And that may not necessarily be the right answer. Totally. Yeah. And if you're, if you're uh, like a, a smaller business or you're just a newer business, it can be really hard to get, um, yeah, it can be really hard to get to the numbers, like to know the numbers, especially like when we were starting comp, we were like, well, what's a good number of website visitors? Like, what is good? It's like, oh, we had a thousand this month. Like, is that good? I don't know. And so I think it's always just like focusing on like, yeah, beating yourself, like beating if you're starting from scratch, like just trying to make sure that you're getting better and better. But then, um, yeah, figuring out what the metrics are that you really want to track. Website visitors is an interesting one too, because if you're primarily growing organically, there's a really good chance that you're going to have global coverage. You're going to have geo diversity. You'll have, you know, if the only market you can sell to is the US, but 40, 50% of your traffic is coming from outside the US because it's all organic, then you have a, a, a potentially a loss factor to contend with there that doesn't match up. Whereas on paid, you at least have a little more control. So there's all those things that tend to come up. I think that that trip up a lot of people. Yes. And I'm so glad. I feel like the market's really getting more sophisticated in how they think about website traffic as well. Great point that you just brought up. And another one's like, there was a period where everyone just focused on just as much traffic as possible. And it really became a vanity metric because if you're not converting them, if if it's just, you know, irrelevant traffic or if it's just traffic for the sake of traffic, then really what's the point? I think a lot of it too depends on the business's ability to monetize and how broad their addressable market is. Like in the category of HR, it's more than likely a country specific thing, right? So like until you physically figure it out, okay, we this we're all set up for the state and federal regulations in the US. Okay, maybe Canada, the UK or something like that is next. But then, you know, what do we do with are, are we really going to be able to port this to dozens of other countries? Yeah. So it has limited point. So the paid and account based and all that stuff. What do you think totally. is the biggest mistake that people make when they're just getting started with a program like this? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people think that just creating, like turning a blog post into a video and then posting some sort of like academy or university tag onto the brand is education like it's if you peaked it, yeah so it's not just about turning blog posts into videos and like creating some sort of like flow if you peeled back the curtain or 
you know, peeked behind the curtain of HubSpot Academy. It looks effortless and it feels effortless when you're going through it, but there's so much thought that goes into the background of the experience. There's so much thought that goes into the background of like creating the right curriculum. There's so much that goes, like there's so much that goes in from an instructional design perspective that most people aren't aware of and don't see. And like a lot of people today, they're like, we just launched our academy, go check it out. And it's just a video like random videos of like tool walkthroughs or random videos of a person talking that was formerly a blog post so it's not just about changing the format so i think that would probably be the biggest mistake um people make is like not really understanding what they're uh what they're getting into or not really understanding how to do this with success i think that's the mark of the true professional though is when most people sit and they turn on a a baseball game or a golf match or tennis match or something they're seeing the top of the top as performers and providing entertainment and cheering for they don't necessarily see the thousands or tens of thousands of hours that have gone into the reality of making that happen so yeah i mean the user interviews um figuring out the personas doing all the research to put all together the scripting editing the scripts and all redlining all that stuff yeah they're then by the time they see the finished product, they just assume that, oh, you know, you turned on the record button and go and it was yeah, right out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that also a lot of people don't do, like when they're just like kind of pulling it together, they don't really think about the highest level of like what, yeah, like what is our goal? Like what are we trying to achieve? And also what are our learners or our users or like whoever we're educating, what is their goal? Um, on the HubSpot Academy team, like we didn't just focus on education, we focused on inspiration as well, because like education, taking in the knowledge, that's great, but we want people to be inspired to take action uh, so they can go apply what they just learned. And so we made that like a really big part of our um, like instructional design process and like how we put together content and how we, the scripts we put together, like everything, the video, you know, the backgrounds, everything, the people we brought on for interviews thought about it through like every lens. I was like the why, how, what circle, golden circle thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Simon Sinek. <laughs> it works though. I mean, they're physically, by the time they get done the last section, they're actually seeing examples of what it's supposed to look like when they're all done. Totally. Yes, yes, yes. There's even a social proof element in there also, especially if the example that they're seeing not only is an actual example, but they recognize, have some familiarity with the company or the category of the company or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I could talk about this forever. I'm going to hold back so you can ask the next question. I could go on for a long time. Where do you think all of this is headed next? If we were to come back and revisit and have this conversation three years out from now, five years out from now, what are what's going on right now that's fundamentally going to shape how people approach building academies, customer success, customer ed education? Yeah, uh, sure. So I don't know how you experience every day, but I feel like in my everyday life, all of the B2C companies that I work, that I buy from, their experience, of, experience of, have become so fantastic. They're frictionless. Like I can get in and get out what I need. And it's just so phenomenal. It's like the consumer grade of it is just so high. It's just very high quality. And I think there's a lot for B2B leaders, um, like basically anywhere you are in B2B, I think there's a lot to learn from the B2C world um, and how to create a great user experience. Like I think about when I need something from Target quickly, like I just pull it up on the app, I buy it, I go drive up, I put my parking spot number in, it comes out to my car, it's seamless. And so it's really setting like a higher bar or higher expectation for what people are people want in their experience when they're buying. And so I think there's a lot for people in the B2B world to pull from B2C. And the one thing I will say about that is like, it can be so overwhelming when you look around and you're like, how do I create something like Target? Or how do I like create something like Amazon? Or how do I create something like, even on Facebook, like, I don't know, it's so simple. They know me so well and they target like the perfect ads. And I'm like so tempted all the time to buy everything that they show me. And it's just so simple and the price is great. Um, and it can be so tempting to like look to them and 
it's a, it's a great thing to do, but it's also really important to not get overwhelmed because like, if you look at these great experiences that these B2C companies are creating, it can be overwhelming. And I think it's really important for us to not just focus on that gap from like where you are to where you want to go, but also keep in mind, like the gains that you're making. So like looking back every 90 days and saying like, what, what are we proud of as a team or what are we proud of as a company or what are we proud of like in ourselves for the last 90 days and really focus on that, um, that gain. And Dr. Benjamin Hardy talks about this a lot. And I think he has a book coming out on it soon because the most successful people focus on, on the gain that they've had because that propels them to, to narrow the gap. And when you just constantly look ahead and you're like, we'll never get there, like HubSpot Academy, like if we were trying to be, build our own academy, like that is just so far ahead. Well, it took 10 years to get there, you know? And so it can be really overwhelming to live in here. And so just constantly checking in and being like, you know, are we like, what are we proud of? What's something we're proud of? And then use that to like be your motivator and motivation and inspiration for where you want to go. Yeah, I think there's so much there to unpack with like looking at the shiny examples of who has the world-class experience and thinking that you can do that out of the gate, but there's little things that you can do along the way. Things as basic as like, if people fill out a form on your website and they're going back and forth to try to set up a time with you, there's really, and by in the year we are right now, there's really not a big reason to not have a self booking calendar to uh, eliminate some of those points of friction. I think there's a lot of software companies that are paying a ton of attention now to product-led growth and thinking about how their business models can possibly adapt because if they're taking any kind of capital, there's a big obsession with talking about their unit economics and their cost of acquisition and lifetime yep. value and anything they can do to collapse 16 sales meetings over nine months down to uh, someone just purchasing from uh, essentially a shopping cart and getting started you know, immediately and, or just getting a free version and starting immediately yeah. so they can get usage within the company and start to spread. Yeah. I love You brought, uh, just bringing this full circle. Um, you had mentioned like having really valuable content and videos for people to consume. And I think that does a fantastic job at helping people to like experience your personality, experience how you do business and can shorten the length of the sales cycle tremendously. It's like, if you're thinking about if you're nurturing people, sending them the right content at the right time, or just any helpful content that will bring them back so that they can find like what's most helpful for them in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. This idea of content to educate and build trust even goes back way before digital. Um, people cite the example of Benjamin Franklin with the Farmer's Almanac, Almanac hundreds of years ago, but I remember even relatively early on in my career was selling hardware, basically putting together like short white papers, articles on comparing different things, like how to pick the right specs for your PC or um, how to figure out how to, how to pay for the, these kinds of things. All, all of that did a lot to open the doors and, and get people to feel not only are they learning something, but it completely context shifts out of them feeling like they're being sold to, to them feeling more empowered. And I think that's yeah. a lot of what we've seen in the last eight or 10 years with the whole buyer's journey shifting is giving consumers, giving buyers more power. And the, in the, in the same way we went through the consumerization of IT as we moved to SaaS and we moved to cloud, there's like this whole consumerization of everything B2B where all the influencers and stakeholders and big B2B purchases are realizing that, hey, we're consumers too. You know, why can't buying this be as simple as buying from Warby Parker or Sleep Number or Casper or something like that or Target? Yeah. 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 I love that. I, I, it also made me think like people, I mean, obviously a big component of buying from an organization, especially for a more complicated uh, purchase is going to be trust. And I think when you're selling to someone, asking them, powerful questions that get them to expand their thinking to so like the content's so great because it helps them to expand their thinking and when you're selling to them it's also like challenging you know maybe not challenging but getting them to to think in a more expansive way so can your con how can you have your content to do that and how can you uh further reinforce that in your sales process as well like i love talking to people that expand my mind that get me thinking about something differently and if if they can do that i'm like yeah i'm gonna give you my money i might not even use what i'm what you're selling me but it's just it was so powerful to interact with you and um 
yeah, it just felt good. It's like the Maya Angelou quote, like people forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget the way you make them feel. And if you can make someone feel great while they're in, the, in your sales process, um, they're going to remember that and turn back, yeah, come back to you. And I actually think about it in my own journey of inbound marketing and HubSpot and a, a lot of, I think the company's success was with timing, you know, there were iPhone and iPad and everything coming out in 2007, 2010 and everything, but it's hard to imagine HubSpot doing what they did without having this tremendous investment and execution on everything related to inbound marketing and content and thought leadership to basically create this whole category. Uh, I, I think in a lot of ways, the differentiation is the company, the differentiation with the culture. I can't imagine it happening without um, an outrageously high value on and premium on creating great live and recorded video content, audio content, text content, and image content, and just doing it at a massive totally. scale. Yes. Oh. And the blog content, like all of the content they put out, they were so creative. Like it, I think that's the other thing. I, I, I wish I could remember the Jeff Bezos quote, but he's, it's basically about like, not nah, maybe you can fill it in later for me, but it's basically like um, inventing your way out of a box. Like the best constraint is, sorry, the best way to innovate is a constraint. Um, and if like you're strapped for time or strapped for money, like how can you get really creative so that you can stand out? Um, so I think HubSpot did a really a excellent job. You think about some of their first videos they created and they were just really weird and so creative that you couldn't help but be like, that's cool. Like they're going for it. Um, what a fantastic way to stand out. Early streaming video, early viral videos. Yeah, I, I remember even when Academy switched over from doing webinars to the smaller chunked videos, and I'm sure it made a difference with people's attention span. That was like a massive inflection point for our team and our success. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the biggest. Yep. You needed the technology, though, to be able to see the watch time, because if you had no idea, like, OK, this is a 60 minute video or 20 minute video, how many people are actually making it to the end? And if we cut it down and break it up in pieces, are they more likely to make it all the way to the end? Totally. But I'll tell you, Joshua, like we didn't have any budget back then. We were still such an early team. We we're still considering an experiment inside the organization. And um, I mean, I guess we were getting we were growing our team. So there was like definitely some belief that things were going well. But we we were using like still website pages for to like host our videos. Sorry, we used Wistia to host our videos. We developed a partnership with Wistia. And they were like, if we, I think it was basically like, if we can use some of your data and analytics to like inform our product, like we'll give it to you inexpensively. Like we got really creative in how we did that. So Everyone, yes. a lot of times looks at companies that they think are significantly better and bigger and thinking that they have these bottomless resources. I worked for IBM during college and it was a unit of IBM that was designed to sell discounted hardware and software on campuses. We had next to no budget, like to save money on photocopies. I would drive down to the office and use their <laughs> photocopy machine. When it came to like bartering, people saw that like yeah, we were listed as a sponsor with the Rutgers athletic department, but it wasn't a cash sponsorship. We had hardware laying around and we loaned them PCs, which back, you know, 20, back when I was in school, actually were expensive enough that there was significant value in someone loaning you a, a hardware for, for a year or two, whatever yeah. it was. But yeah, a lot of times people, it's, it's, it's interesting too. Even I remember when I wrote the book for Microsoft, which was a subsidiary of Microsoft. And at the time, everyone was like, Microsoft doesn't have bottomless, but no, it's a subsidiary of that. And you have to provide value and get creative. And yeah, it's yeah. interesting how people make those assumptions. How creative. Yes, yes, yes. And I, it was funny. The last thing I'll say, sorry, I, I clearly i am very excited right now. And I think this is such a fruitful conversation. Um, when I left HubSpot, like I felt like when I was at HubSpot, we were kind of trying to look small, like we were such a big organization and we were really trying to like look small and approachable and tangible, like, and then when I was started Compt, it was like, we're such a small business and we're trying to look so big, <laughs> like everything we just, we were just trying to look so much bigger than we were. And I, I just, I think that paradox is funny. That the larger company is trying to show empathy for the entrepreneur and the small business and then the startup and the entrepreneur to have credibility with mid-market and enterprise clients. But con content helps with that a lot. Often yeah, said content, that yeah. like a, a research report that's done well, that's insightful, like, is it really 
perceive that much different when it's a startup versus when it comes from like Gartner or IDC or Forrester. Yeah, it doesn't have their logo on it, but it also can draw the same, a lot of times the same reaction, the same credibility, the same um, positioning with. Yes, yes. You can do with it. I love that. One of the things that we did at Comp that was transformational for our business was on the marketing side, we created pillar pages and those pillar pages, I mean, I was like, you know, I was really getting out, getting like, how do I describe this? I was like, really just bringing my whole thought leadership game, game. And I was just trying to really think big and like think in different angles. And it just, I was really proud with how it came out. And then um, CNBC saw one of, saw the, uh, I'm sorry, CNBC saw one of our pillar pages and linked to it and a huge piece they did on stipends and then another business um oh my gosh was it fortune like another really big brand name saw the pillar page and reached out and asked us if we if they could do an interview so we ended up having our ceo get interviewed by them and it was just so phenomenal for ex phenomenal for our, sharing our voice and our narrative and our thoughts but also expediting um like our brand this pillar page is like just took us from who are they to now they're getting linked to and interviews with Fortune and NASDAQ and CNBC links. And so. I think what a lot of times what startup founders don't see the forest through the trees on is that content opens the doors and paves the way. Uh, Eric Reeson, Lean Startup, has a great example of that. I think it was someone that was trying to sell uh, lawnmower or something like that. And some early conversations said, wait a second, vineyards would be a much more productive um, niche for you to go after as opposed to universities. Mowing their lawn. And it's the same kind of thing as that when you create that kind of content and someone loves the content, that's what helps a lot of times gives you what you need to figure out the pivots that cause you to reinvent the business because they say, hey, Sarah, I love this report that you put out. The insights are just fantastic. I've never seen anyone explain it like that. By the way, that product that you're working on, it's really good, but it's missing this one thing. And I know if you added this one feature, we're signed on yesterday and I have like six friends and other companies in similar roles, they would sign on like yesterday too. So, and, and, and all of a sudden you're like jaw dropped and you realize that they just gave you seven figures worth of insight to help you figure out where the business is going to go next in this pivot that wouldn't have manifested itself if the thought leadership hadn't opened the door and, and op opened them up to that kind of conversation with you. I'm just nodding vigorously here. I could not agree more. Like I think back to how that happened to us many times at Comp to like helped us to define where we were going with the product even better. And it started with pillar pages and content that we put out there that people downloaded and then asked questions and went to the next stage of the, the buyer's journey. So yes, yes, yes. Even this process a lot of times can be used really well. Like you in a podcast, you might ask different questions than you would in a user interview, like by our persona kind of interview. But the reality is a lot of what you learn, if you take have an editorial calendar and you're like, you know what, I want to interview 10 people, 15 people in this role over the next couple of weeks or next couple of months, there's a really good chance in the course of creating content that gives you video content, audio content, and text content that you're also finding out some really valuable customer insights that'll impact your whole go-to-market strategy and potentially even your product roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I feel like is, most people don't talk about that, but yeah. Yeah. There's so much, so much value from just getting closer to customers with all of that. Um, but this has been terrific. Um, I'm so glad so that we fun. got a chance to talk. Yes, I'm glad, me glad, too. We got a glad we got a chance to reconnect. Sarah, what's the best way for someone to learn more about what you're currently working on at uh, SAS Academy Advisors and Thrive Coaching? Yeah, uh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn, Sarah Bedrick. There's not many Bedricks out there, so I'm pretty easy to find. But yeah, I'll make sure That's I include place. the uh, link for that in the show notes as well to make it easier. But yeah, thanks so much, Sarah, for joining me today. I wish you all the best. It's really fascinating hearing how everything started with the lemonade stand and the origami <laughs> business. <laughs> So, so much of the things we we uh, start as kids, it's amazing the long life on that thing. I look at some of the lessons I learned with product management when I had a paper route segmenting the market and expansion revenue and outreach and customer service and pricing and everything. Totally. It's just yes. What a great way to like come home. Think about what you loved as like a child um, and like what you found yourself doing for fun. And that's a really great insight to like what brings you to life, what brings you alive, makes you alive. For sure. That's funny. <laughs> the paper route segmenting. This is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. Sarah. Um, so much fun. Thank you. 
likewise, definitely keep in touch. Sounds good. Thanks, Joshua. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitize.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.